Welcome to the Psychology World Podcast. I'm O'Connor Whiteley, bringing you psychology news, articles and other interesting psychology related articles. Here where I can find the podcast notes and more interesting psychology related things and here where I can get your free 8 psychology book box set at ConnorWhiteley.net. Now let's get on to the show. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 57 of the Psychology World Podcast with me, Connor Whiteley. And today's episode is on what is formulation in psychotherapy. So I really, really enjoy today's episode. I absolutely love it and hopefully you will too. And it's Friday the 16th of October 2020 as I record this. So moving on to psychology news section. So moving from a bit of psychological society research to the digest. Okay, so I really like pandemic times um useful one. So phone calls help create closer bonds than texting. For its many flaws, it's hard to deny that technology has improved our ability to communicate with one another. We now have a huge range of options when it comes to speaking to our friends and family, whether we're texting, I am in, oh, instant messaging, yeah, it's just, yep, okay, it just shows that um, I don't really do much of this te- technology stuff, or sending them emails. With such a smash board of choices available to us, it can be easy to forget the humble phone caller, and according to new work published in the Journal of Experimental Psychology, a reticence to pick up the phone might be robbing us of a stronger connection with those that we love. And this I completely understand. And the main reason why I fully believe it is it comes down to showing your humanity. Anyone can text, but when you pick up your phone call, you make a call, your friend and family can hear your voice, they can feel your emotions, they can know if you're happy, sad, and they can interact with you instead of a virtual you. So like moving on to um, another one. So... Leaders can feel licensed to behave badly when they have morally upstanding followers. Countless studies have investigated how a leader's behaviour influences their followers. There's been very little work though on the reverse, how followers might be influent, uh, how followers might influence their leaders. Now a new paper published in Journal of Applied Psychology helps to plug that gap with an alarming finding. Good morally upstanding followers can create less ethical leaders. And that I can also understand, to be honest, simply because, well, with leaders having so many ethical and good in employees, other than what might happen, happen is that they might cause them to justify their behaviour because they could quite easily say one of two things. So one, I would never do that. Why would I behave badly? I mean, have you seen all the employees that I've raised to be good ethical people? Yes, yeah, so like, that's enough of the psychology news section. Let's move on to the personal update. So we're moving on to the personal update. So to be honest, there's actually not a lot to say in that. Yeah, but there's actually like not a lot to say in my personal update simply because it's been a really busy week at, un- at university and I could not believe I woke up at nine o'clock this morning. I was horrified with myself because that's really, really late for me. Usually I'm up at seven, eight at the very latest. I, so I've missed, you know, so I missed like an entire hour. So I wasn't exactly impressed. It does just go to show don't overbook yourself and I think that's the takeaway tip from today's episode was what happened was is that it's been quite a few busy days at the university because what I want to start doing is I want to do uni work on a Sunday afternoon Monday Tuesday yes and then after that's it because then it gives me Wednesday afternoon Thursday and Friday to do writing stuff and business stuff well that did sort of happen but then there were projects I had a team at a meeting and then I also booked to attend um, two sessions at the Frankfurt Book Fair, which is a which is a major international um, publishing a conference, which was for free this year. Yes, I attended like both of them, so I sort of I don't know. I think I sort of like burnt out because I had my placement evening last night. Yeah, right, last night, and I did some stuff afterwards. Yeah, so um, I won't quite be stretching myself out like that much again, but it was good. To, Good. Uh, yes, and I won't talk about the book fit on this podcast because it's not to do with um, psychology, but I've really enjoyed it. To be honest, there's actually not a lot to say because in the future I will talk about the projects and everything, or anything like, for example, I'll probably come into the thematic analysis once I know what that actually is. Yeah, but it's just like um, stuff like that. And then the only mildly related thing I've had, you wonderful podcast listeners might be interested in, is that my Kickstarter money got paid to me. So I'm starting, and I mean starting, um, <laughs> yes, I'm starting to make my books available 
to um, libraries, bookstores, um, basically everywhere that Amazon isn't. It's a slow process, 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 because I'm trying to upload this one book at the moment, and it's just not, and it's just like it's really difficult. So I'm having to ask other authors to help me. In a short though, you should be able to order my books for free at your local library. These are the print books at your local library for free, and you can also get them from your own from your bookstores. Or oh, something else I want to mention is is Monday and Tuesday. I you know, but Monday and Tuesday I was like, putting up some stuff. For, but yes, I can put up some stuff. So you can actually buy journals. Yes, yes, like psychology themed journals from me on Amazon. So if you type in um psychology journals Connor or um psychology journals Connor Whiteley, then they should like come up. And like, oh, what they are is that they're just like paperback books, but they've got tons of lines in that so you can like make write notes in. Yes, yeah, so like if you're a student, you can write like lecture notes in there. If you're a psychologist, then you can write client notes in them. Yes, yeah, so I actually really like, and there's over like 200 pages in there, and they're like six by nine inches. Yes, yeah, so like they can fit into your bag easily. Yes, plus I'm not sure if they can be available by Monday, which when you'll be listening to this. But if you type in Psychology Diary 2021, um, Connor Whiteley, then it, you know, apply on Amazon, then it should also bring up some um, diaries. Yeah, because I also decided to do um, 2021 um, uh, diaries, so like, you might want to like, check them out. Sponsored product for today's episode is my brand new formulation psychotherapy book. So this I absolutely love. Whether you're a student or a trained professional, this book will be useful. Formulation in psychology and psychotherapy is an important skill that that is needed in clinical psychology and many professional organisations require you to have this skill. This book will help you to start developing this critical skill. So do you want to know what formulation is? Do you want to know how to use formulation in therapy? Do you want to learn how the different therapies use a formulation in their own and unique way? If the answer to these questions is yes, then this is the book for you, as you'll learn a lot of great in-depth information about formulation and its different approaches in an easy to understand way. By the end of this book, you will know what formulation is, why formulation is important, how formulation in CBT is done, how the different approaches apply formulation in different interesting ways and much more. If you're interested in formulation and clinical psychology, then you'll enjoy this book. Buy today to learn more about formulation. And this, like all of my books, is a great gift for psychologists, psychology students, or anyone interested in psychology this Christmas. Because, yes, I have started to think about um, Christmas sales. (laughs) Yes, like that book, I absolutely love it because it was such a passion project. If you're going to do clinical psychology or if you are doing clinical psychology, highly, highly recommend it because it's such a good topic and it's such a critical school. And it also goes into the debates and controversies around formulation and some really helpful f- and some really helpful stuff for the future. So you can buy the ebook available on all major ebook retailers like Amazon, Kobo, Google Play, Barnes and Noble, and many more. You can get it for free. And stuff like you, I can get the ebook for free at your local library if you request it, and you can get the large print and paperback version on Amazon. Hopefully, you'll be able to get the print book for free at your local library, and also be able to order it from your um, local uh, bookstores. And hopefully, you'll also be able to get the hardback, which I'm really excited about. Yes, like a last formulation in a psychotherapy. Really hope you enjoy it. Right, so let's move into the um, content part of today's episode. So moving on to the content part of today's episode. So we're going to be talking about what is a formulation in psychotherapy. Again, I'm so I'm just so looking forward to today's episode. So what is formulation? So in essence, formulation can be understood as a hypothesis to be tested because Butler, 1998, states that formulation is the tool used by um, clinicians to relate theory to practice, and that's one of the reasons why I love about it because sometimes psychology can be very abstract. You sometimes you can't really feel like you can apply it to everyday life, but this is the wonderful thing about it is that formulation can help you relate what you learn or what you learn about psychology and apply it to the real world. But the problem, yeah, but the problem, yeah, but the problem in psychology and like everything is that there's not one definition. So here are some other ones. So open quote: A psychotherapy case formulation is essentially a hypothesis about the causes precipitants and maintaining influences of a person's psychological, interpersonal and behavioural problems. Uh, and close quote. This is Elves, 1997, page 4. Open quote. A process of ongoing collaborative sense-making. That one I really like. So, close quote. That's Harper and Moss, 2003, page 8. 
So this is one I really, really like. But in case you've done clinical psychology at all, then you would, uh, yes, then you will know um, Lucy Johnston. Because she's a major figure in a formulation and she is, uh, I don't know, but she's just really influential in the field of formulation. Yes, and this is her definition. So open quote. Formulation can be defined as the process of co-constructing a hypothesis, or best guess, about the origins of a person's difficulties in the context of their relationship, social circumstances, life events, and the sense that they have made of them. It applies to structure of thinking together, client or service user, about how to understand their experiences and how to move forward. Formulation draws on two equally important sources of evidence. The clinician brings knowledge derived from theory, research and clinical expertise, or the service user brings expertise to their own life and the meaning and the impact of the relationship and their circumstances. Johnson, 2018. So this is what I really love about it's all about helping the, the client. It's all about making their lives better. And come on, who doesn't like making up a good like, guesses about um, why someone's experiencing the difficulties? Yes, and I also like to say in like, my notes that you cannot get a more comprehensive definition of a formulation because... I was like reading that and I was just thinking, wow, this is a, you know, this is a proper psychology definition. But overall, a formulation is when you um, summarise a client's core difficulties and it shows how the client's difficulties are related to one another. And it uses psychological theory to explain why and how the client's difficulties are happening. And the entire point of a formulation is to help inform a um, intervention. But the thing that I like about a formulation, though, is that it's all about tailor making the therapy like for the client in and instead of saying, Well, you've got depression, um, CBT works for everyone, so let's just give you CBT, even though CBT or cognitive behavioural therapy might not work for you. So now I want to talk about why is it important. Yeah, because like first of all, I just I want to say if I didn't feel like formulation was important, I would not have done a book on it. Oh, I really would not. So the reason why a formulation is important to know about is that if you plan to go into clinical psychology as a profession, then you need to know that formulation is a major topic and it's very important for various reasons. And this is what you'll discover if you um, read the book. Yes, yes. But another reason why formulation is important is because it's considered a skill by the Health and Care Professionals Council. And according to the Division of Clinical Psychology of the British Psychological Society, 2010, Formulation can be a defining competency of the depression. So that's a pretty major statement. They are basically saying that clinical psychology, for it to be competent, for it to be good, for it to be useful, you need to have a formulation under your belt or you need to be able to use it. So basically, if you want to do clinical psychology as a job, then you need to know about formulation. And yes, that you will learn this in your master's, but I think that today's episode and the book just give you... Yeah, but like I just help to give you like an, an extra like um, leg up and to help you to make you a bit further ahead than some people who might never have known about formulation. So building upon this further, so something that I absolutely love about formulation is that there are so many different approaches, or uh, well, approaches that, that can be taken to create a formulation. Like you've got the negative thoughts and cognitive behavioural therapy. You also got narrative therapy. Then you also got the psychodynamic approach. And in the book, I talk about roughly um, six approaches. And as I've already said, that a formulation applies to the theory to an individual and their own unique um, circumstances. And again, though, what I like about formulation, though, is that it looks because it treats a person as a person and not a number. And then it makes sure that whatever treatment this person is uh, given, then they're going to um, hopefully um, respond to it because it's, because it's tailor-made for them. This is something else that's actually quite interesting. So the term formulation can actually be used as an event and a process. But you can give a formulation, so this is an event, but you can also create a formulation with a client, so this is a process. And another example is that most definitions, like the ones I just um, spoke about, use a formulation as if they're only um, a concrete event, like a letter or a written assignment. Yes, that and I personally prefer to think about formulations as a creative process because Ideally, you should be working with the client to create a formulation that best fits them. Otherwise, what's the point? Because you might as well just be doing the example like that I gave earlier. You've got depression. Let's just give you CBT. <laughs> yeah, but I don't know. And yes, I know that there might be a bit of an extreme example. But personally, I feel I really, really feel like that would happen in my real life. So what makes up a formulation? What are the components? Because I know I keep saying the word formulation and I've explained what it is and why it's important. But... What actually like, makes up it? Okay, 
So in formulation, there are a range of common elements regardless of the therapeutic model used. That mean that, well, it doesn't matter if you used CBT, um, systemic, psychodynamic approach, they all have, yes, have, yes, have, like, they all have some of the same components. So for example, each type of formulation is a hypothesis about a person's difficulties that draws upon the psychological theory. In addition, all formulations summarise the client's core problems by drawing upon psychological principles and theory that allows you to see how a client's problems are related to like one another because the client might, might be experiencing like quite a few like difficulties but it might actually turn out that there's a major one and the other ones are growing or they're being maintained by that one factor meaning that if you can see how these all are interrelated then you might be able to focus on just one then the other ones should also like go away so and also like formulation allows the therapist to suggest why these difficulties have developed at this time in this situation because that's one of the weird things because if you follow the Diocese stressor model. Well, some people have been genetic, genetically depositioned to have certain um, mental conditions, uh, mental conditions. But it's only when the stress um, triggers the genetic vulnerability that's when it forms. So uh, the really interesting thing is, well, what stress caused the genetic vulnerability to be um, egg exposed? So and finally, all the formulations are open to revision or reformulation because they need to be accurate if there's such thing. And corrected again if there's such thing. If something is wrong, <laughs> is wrong with the formulation. And the reason why I'm quite skeptical of the words uh, accurate, correct, and wrong is because in the um, controversies chapter, well, it's just that since this is sort of mainly opinion, but opinion based on strong evidence, is there such thing as wrong or truth? Or I don't know, to be honest. But again, though, the entire thing needs to be stressed that a formulation is used to plan or guide an intervention for the client to live a better, happier life. And again, though, that's the entire point of like psychology, and especially in like clinical psychology, because if you're not helping someone to live a better life, then what's the point of it? The point of it, for like example. But I've spoken about the common element, but there are tons of differences between all because each of the approaches, the approach to formulation. So you've got the most important factors. So for example, systemic um, formulation that focuses on the family and the family patterns, but CBT focuses on the cognitive and the negative thoughts as the most important factors. So you, yes, and then other models place different emphases on reflexivity so this is when you take your own personal opinions into account and how they could affect the therapy you've also got the models that they draw upon and the expert versus a collaborative stance for example some approaches to formulation they take the opinion that this is that the therapist is the expert the client doesn't really matter too much and then you've got the more collaborative ones we had to apply, which is as like lucy johnson said Yes, well, the therapist is the expert in theory and research, but the client is the expert in it themselves because, well, well, they live for themselves. But a formulation can be described as a, as a double-edged sword, as the formulation could reveal no intervention is needed, or the formulation itself could be therapeutic, as it gives the client a greater understanding of their difficulties. And I know I keep drawing on the book, but it's just that later on, it's just that, it's just that tons of this first chapter stuff, which I'm basically like reading from, actually makes a lot more sense because because later in the book it's actually like explained a lot more, and this is sort of a like a foundation chapter, like basically. And also, like, if you go on to the controversies and debates later in the book, quite a few people were like um, a few bits of research like supports that. Yes, yeah, so, but the sole purpose of formulation is not only to, to tailor-made a therapy because there are some other purposes of a formulation as well uh, as well and this is why like, you might do it so for example you might want to do it to ensure a cultural understanding has been incorporated into the intervention it can also strengthen the therapeutic alliance and this is the relationship between the client and the therapist it also um, normalizes the client's difficulties and it also increases the sense of agency which has been there from a few episodes ago. That means I've been um, proactive, <laughs> hope and meaning. And the reason why I laughed there was because I had no idea what agency was. And it's a big word in psychology because it's thrown around quite a lot. Right, yes, yeah, so like the last thing I want to talk about is best practices. This, this is when you're going to do a formulation or when you might want to do a formulation. So this is stuff that are best practices and things that you should do. 
simply because uh, while any therapeutic technique, formulation can be harmful, and but it can also be helpful. And of course, like everything, it depends how you use the internet. It can be a great thing, but if you use it in the wrong way, it can be really harmful. Yes, like these are some of the best. Uh, yes, like these are some of the best practices, and you can see the references and the sources um, on the blog post at colinwhiteley.net forward slash blog. Some of the best practices are. It needs to be grounded in appropriate depth and level of breadth. Yes, this is when you focus on enough factors and you make sure that you look at these factors in a depth in, in instead of just saying, well, you're depressed, you've got negative thoughts, that's it. All right, we don't need to see what your negative thoughts are. What's that? And then, it, yes, and then, it, yes, and then you also need to be culturally um, um, sensitive and then you also need to use accessible language because psychology is full of really quite wordy really boring words i mean in that well it's quite difficult to read and to be honest as a reader you can really just be turned off like by it like for example i was reading a textbook like this week and i was just flicking through because it was so dull and it was just so not accessible language and some of them are is that like, you have to consider the possible role of trauma and abuse and you have to admit that sometimes the surface so this could be the nhs hospital the therapist itself could be confounding the problem at. or it could be like maintaining it so for example if a person's uh, been like neglected blah, blah, and they're seeing a therapist like once a week for an hour is uh, the most human contact like a person has uh, and the most social contact a person has uh, then they might want to keep their condition just so they do get that social contact like every week or whenever the uh, therapy session is and then a formation has to be in the form by social slash societal and um service slash also that's org- organizational factors like for example like i know like the u.s is the run up to the u.s election well, election meaning that that's a societal factor so for example how could the u.s election possibly affect someone's like mental health yes like that's just like something to think about finally like here's just a quick checklist for how a formulation as a process could be used these are just some best like practices yes like a therapist needs to be clear about who has the problem yes i like, simply because if someone's been referred to the actual client might not have a problem it might be the other people around them might think oh that's weird they must have a problem when actually it could not be. So let's think of a like um, random like, example. Of a course that completely fictional. Yes, let's say someone like has a fight and let's say that somehow gets them like referred. But just because they had a fight does not mean they have a problem. It uh, could be the person who they fought with has a problem with them. The person who got referred to could have been done it could have done it in like self-defense or it's just like stuff like that like just because someone could be referred to a therapist doesn't mean they've got the problem so that you also need to think about and then you also need to include to like you would need to like reflect on your own like assumptions and the values of like just to make sure that they're not negatively impacting the formulation because that could mean that the clients might not be able to be helped as much as they could because you might have a bias or you might have prejudice against them and then you also need to um, do it collaboratively and like you need to work with the client uh, to be able to help them well so, like, i hope you were in enjoyed today's episode about formulation like, i really enjoyed like this book i see i can find formulation in a psychotherapy in therapy on all major ebook retailers and you can get the print book available on Amazon, and that's paperback and large print. So everyone, have a great day, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to see the show notes, then please go to connorwhitely.net. And if you want a free Ada book psychology box set, then please go to connorwhitely.net. Have a great day, and I'll see you next time.